Okay, so have you ever, we're getting into the message now. Did you feel this, the transition that just happened? Nice transition. So uh, have you ever caught yourself asking this question? Um, I think that's, that's good enough, right? Or just making the statement, that's, that's good enough. Gives right? me hives. Yeah, that's not something we like to say very often because we like excellence and everything. But, you know, it's okay. I guess if you're like, if you're not too OCD and you're wrapping a Christmas present and you say, that's good enough, that's okay. Especially if your kid did it, okay? If your little four-year-old did it. Um, if you're decorating your Christmas tree, it's okay to step back and say, that's good enough. But not when it comes to your destiny, not when it comes to, to the reason why God formed you in your mother's womb and gave you a name, a hope, and a purpose, and a plan on planet Earth. It's not okay to step back in regards to your life and your walk with God and everything that he has in store for you and to say, it's good enough. Don't be caught up in the trap of thinking that what you have going on right now, the way things are, that it's good enough because, and this is what the series is called, you were made for more. Say more. More. You were made for more. You were made for more than you can ever possibly imagine or even think. And we're going to hit this Christmas series from a different outside-the-box perspective because there's a really, really, really cool um, aspect to this Christmas story that God, I believe God wants to show you and I. Um, through these next three weeks, all right? So we're going we're gonna to pull out of this Christmas story, um, really looking into who you are and why you were created and what you should be doing, all right? Those three mountain-moving aspects to your life, it will change you. We are really excited about this series because it is going to, if you'll allow it, it'll absolutely wreck and change your life all at the same time, and you'll see a complete remodel, and it'll position you, I believe, more than anything for 2020 to be the best year yet. But before we get into it, I just want to tell you, um, this is how deeply like convicted I am about today's message. This doesn't happen all the time, but it this time it did. Uh, last last night, guys, uh, I just I could not sleep, and um, went to bed you know late anyway. But then woke up every thirty minutes, just out of a dead trying to get to sleep. Just woke up, just shaking uncontrollably and sweating and crying. Every 30 minutes, like I was having these uh, contractions, like I've never given birth. I will not even attempt to, to ladies to compare myself or even think that I can relate for one second to know what it means to go into labor. But I'm going to tell you, from everything I've heard, it sounded like, it, it felt like we were, and Misty was there with me. We didn't sleep at all last night because it felt like we were giving birth to something that God had in store for you today. But So I wore my shirt today, my Muhammad Ali shirt, because I came to do business. I came to get down and fight on your behalf. Because the devil does not want you to hear today's right. message. That's not hype. I'm not, that's not, I'm not blowing smoke or light. That's nothing, none of that. The devil does not want you to receive today's message. The word of God says that faith comes by hearing. Say hearing. And hearing by the word of God. And so scripture also says that if you'll have faith but as a mustard seed, then you can speak to that mountain by faith, and you can command that it be lifted up and cast into the sea. And that's a whole different message for another day. But, But what I want you to pay attention to is the fact that it's faith that moved the mountain. So in order, if you want mountains to be moved in your life, then you have to tap into faith. And the way you tap into faith is by the hearing of the word of, say it, God, the word of God. So when we talk about God's word, Misty and I, it is, it is our, our passion to get you to a place in your life to where you come through those doors on Sunday morning and you sit in this seat hungry. And you come expecting. And you're like, I'm, I came here to do business. I'm not messing around. Not today, devil. I'm, I'm ready to dig in and get in the word of God and hear what God would speak to the very center of my soul, what God has for my life. And Misty and I have poured ourselves over this. We've prepared a word for you today. And we're praying that you would be hungry. And that you would feast on the goodness of God so that faith can be deposited in your heart so that you can truly move mountains in your life. So my question for you this morning is, who is ready for the word of God? Come on. You know, the enemy is such a liar. And as Brad said, we slept very, very little. And when I don't sleep, then I start to lose my voice when I'm singing and preaching. And we rolled through the second song in first service and I was like, 
oh, this is going to be fabulous. And it made me so mad that I pressed in even harder. And so I'm going to apologize in advance that my voice is shot already, but I'm going to give you everything I got because I truly believe that the Word of God is going to change your life. And I know we say that all the time, but guys, it's why we are who we are. It's because the Word of God has changed our life. And so if we can help you to begin to grasp and understand the text that we are talking about and bring it to life for you, you get excited. It begins to impact you as you begin to apply. So go with me today to Psalms chapter 139. As we launch into this series, today's title is simply this. If you can put part one up for me, it's this, the who in you. Say who. We're talking about the who today. And I want to tell you, a couple weeks ago, I rolled out of my office and I noticed on my desk, there was this little journal and on the journal lay a pen and three different colors of highlighters. And it brought a smile to my face. And let me tell you why. Because I realized that one of my daughters had laid out a journal with her pen and her highlighters to come into this room to take notes of the word of God that was going to go forth because she wanted to make sure that she remembered what was taught so she could apply it to her life. Listen to me. If you're taking notes, you need to write it down. When I take notes, I go back. I go back and I look at notes of where other communicators have spoken and it begins to minister in me weeks and months down the line. So I encourage you, grab your phone, take it out. Did you know that our app has notes on it? If you don't have anything else, you can go to the app, click on notes, and you can take notes that way. But we're going to start Psalms 139. Now listen, I wish I had time to read you verse by verse, but I don't. Psalms 139, you need to go read it on your own. It is one of the most powerful chapters in the entire Word of God. It speaks directly to you. We're going to start at verse 13. It says this, For God created my inmost being. He knit me together in my mother's womb. Or another version says he formed me. You think about Plato. He formed me in my mother's womb. Jump down to verse 16. Your eyes saw my unformed body. Say all. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. I'm going to go back and I'm going to read this again. I want you to think about what I'm reading. All the days of my life and all the days of your life, regardless of what your age, they were ordained for us and they were written in a book before one of them came to be. I want to kind of give you an example of what David was talking about when he wrote this. This right here, Brad, if you'll help me help, help me help. (laughs) If I can talk, it's going to be fabulous. All right. Can you come on this side? Thanks. All right, so this right here is architectural plans. And as you can see the picture, you know that these architectural plans are for the building that's being built right behind us. And what I want you to understand about architectural plans, if you've never built anything, then this might be new to you, but it takes a lot of thought in order to decide every single detail that goes in to something being created, something being built. And so a lot of thought went into every detail Then you go to an architect and they begin to draw out in detail, phase by phase, step by step, until one day this is completed, they send it in the mail and ask you to pay $50,000, okay? That's just kind of how it works. But the plans are very, very important. You see, we didn't move one piece of dirt, we didn't stand one stud, no concrete truck came onto this property before the plans were completed. We opened them up, and this is an absolute every day. These plans are rolled out across the table in our office as the contractor, which happens to be my dad, comes in, and we study over the plans. Why? Because we want to build it right. We want to make sure that it's done correctly, the way we thought it through, the way that the architect says it's got to be built this way to make it safe and secure. Go back to the verse. It says that all the days of our lives were written in a plan before one of them was ever lived out. Okay, wrap your brain around this. God wrote plans while he formed you in your mom's womb. He wrote plans for your life. He's got a hold of them, and he's just waiting for you to take each and every step. Now, what I wish and what you would wish is that God would just say, here they are. 
And you could see the picture of what you're supposed to look like at the end of your life. And you could go all the way to the end and you could say, yes, that's amazing. Oh, my gosh. But you can't do that because God knows you'd freak out. You'd never do it. So he says, I want you to focus on the who. See, a lot of times in our life, from the time we're little bitty, we start talking about purpose for our lives. You don't even realize it. How many of you guys, when you were little, somebody said, hey, what do you want to be when you grow up? Right? Did anybody ever say that? Have you ever said that to a little kid? Come on, get in. help me out. I'm going to lose my voice and you're going to have to preach. How many ever said that? All right? Brad, did anybody ever ask you, what do you want to be when you grow up? Yeah, so when my mom was decorating my room, uh, we moved into a new house, and she said, what do you want in this room? And I said, well, I want to be an astronaut when I grow up. So, astronaut? So I, so I had uh, a big mural on one of the walls. was a picture of planet Earth from the moon, right, which just tells you what kind of kid I was. I was living in outer space. Most of my childhood. Spacey. And so I had these glow-in-the-dark stars hanging from the ceiling, and I had all these space shuttles, uh, collect- collectibles, you know, all these space shuttle toys, and I just loved the idea of one day being an astronaut. But as I got older, I realized, wait a minute, I suck at science, number one. And two, I, I, I'm terrified of heights. Like, I can't go up on a 15, you know, 15 feet in the air without just hugging and holding on to anything that's nearby. So uh, I really wasn't cut out to be an astronaut, but... That's what I want. That's what I thought that I wanted to be because I went to the drawing board and I started kind of trying to redesign the plan myself. All right. So listen, here's what I want you to get a hold of. And you're going to think about this different the rest of your life. We start asking children to tell us what they want to do before they actually even know who they are. You see, nobody helped Brad to understand science is not your area and science has a lot to do with astronauts or math is not your area. You see, what God knew down here deep in the plan was that one day he would use Brad as a pastor. One day he would use Brad to lead people into worship. And so when he was forming him in his mother's womb, he said, I'm going to leave you. I'm going to give you the ability to hear music and be able to play it. And so at a young age, even in a family who had no musical abilities, Brad could hear music and go peck it out on an instrument. When he was four years old, he would invite his little buddy JJ over to his house. Okay, this is an awesome friend. And he would stand up on this little box. After we hit up the ice cream truck. Okay, after ice cream. Popsicles and then go hang out on the front porch. And then they would hang out. He would stand up on this little box and he would preach to his buddy at the age of four. And his mom said she would remember hearing him out there preaching. And then he would say, JJ, bow your head. And he would give an altar call because he had heard Jimmy Swaggered playing in the living room where his mom and dad had been watching it. Listen, Brad didn't realize then God was going to call him to be a pastor and then his assignment was going to be to pastor a church. But God knew what the plan was all along. So he made sure that when he made him, he put the right components into his body and into his mind and into his soul so that when he was born and he came forth, he would have everything he needed to complete the plan. All right? But a lot of times in our life, we're so focused on the what we're supposed to do that we miss it because we haven't prepared the who. All right? Do not miss this, guys. I know it's deep and it's, it's like, okay, you got to really get your head around it. Let me help you by putting it this way. There's three things that you see when you talk about purpose. Here they are. When we talk about purpose, we're talking about, can you throw them up for me? Identity, identity, calling, and assignment. All right, if you're taking notes, these are something to write down. Identity is the who. Who are you? All right, ask yourself, who am I? We'll come back to you in a second. Calling is why you do what you do. An assignment is what you do. But so often we are focused on what we do, the title that we have, all right? And so what I want to help you to understand, and Brad and I through this series, we're going to come at this Christmas story from a whole different perspective. We are going to look at the characters in the Bible story and who they really were and what they did, okay? But I want you to think about something. Can you open up this one more time? I'm sorry, man. I'm giving it my best, but my voice is shot. One of the very first things that you see on this architectural plan, if you go to the next page, this is not the original. It could be ripped up. Okay. 
is you start going through here and you're going to see a plan for a foundation. All right. And listen, man, when we started the foundation work, it was the most annoying thing ever. It took so many days for dirt to be moved and dirt brought in and then forms to be set all for a foundation. But it was so important that the foundation was right because everything else was going to be built on the foundation. I mean, every screw had to go in the right spot in order for the foundation to be right for the building to stand on it. Listen to me. We have it so wrong with this lineup in our culture. We have made the foundation what we do, what our title is, rather than who we are. What we have got to do, and point number one is this, you've got to start focusing on who you are and becoming who God needs you to be before he ever reveals to you what he wants you to do. Because listen, the assignment can change. But when you get your life so wrapped up around the assignment, what you're doing, then when God changes it, it wrecks you. Let me, let me help you. I'm not sure you're getting it by your faces. Let me, let me get you in another way. Who I am is a child of God. Who I am is truly a servant of the Most High. My calling by God, which I did not even understand until I was about 19 years old in college, because I had spent so many years trying to become who God wanted me to be, that one day I was in my face praying after a chapel service when everybody else left. I stayed. And I'll never forget, a professor came over and was praying for me. And I remember very vividly that they began to speak over my life. And I got up and she said, God's called you to preach, hasn't he? And I was terrified because, one, my whole degree in college was not for that. I was like, oh, my gosh. But God changed my direction. And he said, you're going to pastor. You're going to preach. That's my calling. My assignment currently, Brad and I's assignment at this time is to pastor Mountain Rivers Church. That's what we do. Okay? Follow me. We can build this building. And next year, we get it all built. And we feel like, man, we worked so hard for three years to build it. And God could say, I'm done with you there. Pack it up. Your family's going to Africa. I got a new assignment. And if we did not know who we were in Christ, we could be a wreck because it could be like, God, I poured my heart and soul and everything that I was into MMC. Because you see, so often we get wrapped around a title. God can send us out and say, you're now going to go to Africa and nobody knows you. And you're going to start over, but you're going to go one-on-one and you're going to witness. Because at the end of the day, if you know who you are, it makes no different what the assignment is. Every decision in your life is going to be based on the who. So when God speaks, you're going to say, what do you want me to do? It doesn't make any difference. Every decision is going to be based on the who. Thank you, because I'm about to, I'm not going to have any voice for four. Somebody, I hope you've been in here twice. You can come preach it again, because I'm not going to be able to do it. Listen to me. Every decision I make is based on who I am. Follow me. Is the enemy going to tempt you? Heck yeah, he's going to tempt you. He tempted me to not want to show up this morning. I've had no sleep. I'm like, I don't want to go. If you'd have been up all night, would you show up today? Probably not. You'd be like, heck no, I'm not going to church. But you know what we got? We got mad. Because we realized that there was an enemy messing with us. We had already predetermined what we were doing. Who you are determines everything. It determines your perspective. It determines your decisions. It doesn't matter what God asks you to do. The answer will always be yes because of who you are. Go with me this morning to Luke Chapter 1, we're going to go to the very beginning of the Bible story for Christmas, and you're thinking to yourself, I know this story. This is so awesome. I'm going to get it right. It's about Mary, Joseph, and baby Jesus. That's actually not the beginning of the story. The very beginning of the Christmas story starts out with a husband and wife, and it's not Mary and Joseph. Go with me, Luke chapter 1. So we're going to introduce you to a couple uh, by the name of Zach and Lizzie. And Zach and Lizzie uh, are madly in love with God. Um, they, their whole world is wrapped up in just being who God wants them to be. And I want to show you in this story, the very, very beginning of this Christmas story, how God rolls 
these things out as far as what he wants them to do because of who they are. And that's such a great picture, such a great example of what God wants to do in your life. Um, so it says in, in verse 5, it says, There uh, was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest, say priest, named Zacharias of the division of Abijah. His wife was of the daughters of Aaron. Her name was Elizabeth. And they were, born, they were both righteous, say righteous, before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. All right, so, so a priest or a pastor is what Zacharias was. I mean, that's, that's what he did. That is the service that he offered for the Lord on a regular basis. That, that's, that's all about when we go to those three things that Misty had, that's assignment. That was his assignment, was to be a priest, was to be a pastor in his day, in his community. But that's not who he was. Who he was was righteous. Say righteous. righteous. So this is, this is everything. When you get a hold of this and you realize what, what God's really showing you here for your life, this is the foundation for everything. Righteousness is right positioning with God. It's getting, in, it's getting right where God wants you to be. So that the plans, you're never going to understand the plans for your life. None of this is ever going to make sense until you can get within hearing distance of the Father. Until you can get to a position and to a place to where you can hear God, you're not going to be able to do things that God had planned for you long ago. So you got to get yourself in right positioning where you got to get yourself in righteousness. Now, I know that you probably get tired of hearing this, but I know people who have been going to church their entire lives and they still cannot read their word every single day. Now, I know I messed up on your toes, but you'll get over it, and you know I love you, and it's all good. But, you, but stop being spiritually lazy, because you are settling for less when God has more. You, you, are, you are allowing the enemy to let you slip into this routine of not doing the, what God wants you to do so you can find that right positioning in him. And then do you spend most of your time complaining because it's just not working out and things aren't right and you're miserable? It's because you're not in right positioning to hear what God has to say for your life. So you're just wandering around aimlessly without purpose and without plan. So Zach and Lizzie, man, they, they were up every morning. This is what they were like. They were on you version. That they were going through their, their, their one-year uh, reading plan. They were going through their chapters together as a couple. They were drinking their coffee, and then they'd spend adequate time really just pressing into God's presence together. They, Zach, I mean, he refused to head off to the church until they had spent time praying together. And I don't mean just praying together. I mean touching heaven together because he loved, he loved his wife so much. He, his responsibility as the covering of his home was to cover her with prayer and, and to seek God's presence and to feed her the word of God every single day. And because he was that kind of guy, listen to me, because he was that kind of guy, listen to what God does. So he's in the temple. He's in the church. The whole church is out. So this is what they did in that day. The whole church was outside because they didn't have access to the throne room of God like we do now. So they, they were all outside. He was inside offering incense and, and, and going through these, um, these traditions. And, but he was in God's presence. And all of a sudden, this angel shows up. And, and, and when the angel shows up, he says, hey, um, so uh, Zach, um, God wants to do something. He's heard your prayer. Now, what I didn't mention was they, they were old in age. All right, Zach and Lizzie were older in age, and they had never had any children. And their greatest heart's desire is that God would bless them with at least a child, that God would at least bless them with a child. So there was desires that they had deep in their hearts, right? And because in that day, if women didn't have children, that was part of their identity. It was, it was a shame, you know, for women to not be able to have children in that day, and they were looked down upon. So she was really hoping that God would bless her with a child because she was having an identity crisis because who she really, what she wanted to do is what she wanted to be a mom. But, but God was saying, look, I just want you to be righteous and love me and serve me. And because they did that, then God blesses them. And, and, and God, so when the angel shows up, he says, this child that I'm giving you, it's not just any child. This child is will be who a lot of us know as John the Baptist. John the Baptist was known for 
leading one of the largest revivals of all time. He was, he was Jesus' cousin, and this is where the Christmas story starts. He was Jesus' cousin, and his, as he grew up, he goes out into uh, rural America, if you will, rural Israel, and he goes preaching the good news of Jesus. He goes preparing the way. He's telling everybody, hey, turn away from your old life and realize that there's somebody coming that is unbelievably amazing, King of kings, Lord of lords. He's, he's coming. He's going to be here soon. Get your hearts ready. And he was, and he was baptizing these people out in the, in the creek. And, and, man, just people were just coming to God left and right. This was huge. But what, what I want you to get in this story is that Zach and Lizzie, they come to a point in their life, they were older in years. And, and everybody respected them because they were holding these high titles in the church. Everybody in the community, maybe thousands of people, they regarded them highly. Because of their titles and because of their accomplishments, everything they had done in ministry, feeding homeless people and caring for orphans and all this great stuff that they had done, great stuff. But what they didn't realize is that God had made them for more, more than they had ever thought was possible. God made them for more. So God blesses them with a son that's going to reach all these people for the glory of God. But what I want you to notice in this, Matthew 6 and 33 says, seek first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness. And what? And all these things will be added to you, will be added to your life. You know, for, for Zach and Lizzie, that thing was to have a child. They so desperately wanted a child. Seek first the kingdom of heaven and his Right positioning. Get in the right position with God. Get in your word every day. Get in God's presence. Get hungry for the things of God. Get hungry to please God in your, in your life, in your attitude, in your actions. Make God your number one everything. And when you do that, these things, say things, the things will be added to you. So God blesses them with a child. But, but in the middle of God showing them their assignment, Zach speaks up, and he starts reminding the angel of the Lord that he's old in age and that they have no children. He starts bringing to the surface the obvious. He starts bringing to the surface, starts explaining why this would be crazy for something like this to happen. And the angel, here's what the angel does. He says, look, Zach, he said, um... He said, I'm Gabriel, verse 19. He says, I'm Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God and was sent to speak to you. I was sent to give you your assignment and bring you this news. Here's what he was saying. He was saying, I know who I am. And the reason I know who I am as the, as the angel Gabriel is because I spend 24 hours a day, seven days a week in the presence of God. Because I spend time in the presence of God, I know who I am. But you clearly don't know who you are. You clearly don't know what you were really called to do. See, you can even get caught up in, on the serve team serving every week. You can be putting invite cards on those seats when you're really supposed to be up here preaching the word of God. And you can get caught up in doing good things. Say good things. Really, really, really good things. But it's not the God things that he has in store for your life because you've settled for less when God has so much more. Don't settle for less. We throw up the screen that shows what should be our foundation. I want you to notice as we're wrapping this up, what has to be the foundation is not the assignment, but the identity. When you begin to focus on who you are supposed to be, you don't have to worry about calling and assignment. They will follow. What you need to worry about right now in your life is not, God, what do you want me to do? But God, who do you want me to? to be. And the only way you're ever going to know who God wants you to be is if you will take the time to be in God's presence. It's simple, but yet so many in the church are unfortunately spiritually lazy. And we want the blessings of God. Bring on the gifts. Come on, Jesus, bring on the gifts. And he's like, come on, put in the time. Be who I want you to be. Because I've got so many gifts. I've got so many plans already written for your life. But I need you to know who you are. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to handle it. Will you bow your heads with us this morning? God, I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you that your word so clearly lays out 
that you have a purpose and you have already written a plan for all of our lives. God, I thank you that even when we have gotten off course and even when we've made our own plans, God, you're willing to revise and realign and get us back where you want us to be to move forward. God, I thank you today, Lord, for each and every individual under the sound of my voice. God, I pray that you'd begin to stir within our hearts right now. God, that a longing to know who we are and to go after your presence with everything inside of us, to go after right positioning, God, because we want to understand our calling and what we were created to do. But God, more than that, we want to know who we are in you. This morning, I want to just encourage you and I challenge you over the next coming weeks. Make who you are your foundation. Go after God with everything inside of you and you won't even recognize what God does with your life in 2020. If you're here in this room today and you do not have a real relationship with Jesus, he's not the foundation of your life. He's simply someone that you acknowledge, that you believe is out there, but he's not close. He's not changing your life. I want to tell you today, you can invite Jesus into your heart. He will come in. He will forgive you of your sins. He'll set you up for the true purpose he has for you. If you're in this place today and you want a real relationship with God, we're going to pray a very simple prayer. And I'm just going to ask you before we pray, if that's you, you want a real relationship with God, you want Jesus to be the Lord of your life, you want heaven to be your home, will you just throw your hand in the air? Nobody is looking around, only your pastors, and then we're going to pray. Will you pray this prayer with me? Say, dear Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins, the things that I've done wrong. God, I have fallen short of your standard. But God, I believe that you wrote a plan for my life before I was born. And I want my life to line up with your plan. Show me who I am. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. We put your hands together for those today who have made that awesome decision. Thanks for joining us today. We sincerely hope the message impacted your life. Stay connected with us by following us online, or you can find us on Facebook. If you would like to partner with us financially, we have a few easy ways to give. You can text your giving to 77977 and simply type in MMC and follow the prompts. Or you could find us online at www.mountainmoverschurch.org and click the Give Now tab. Or you could simply mail your giving in to 24000 South 660 Road, Grove, Oklahoma, 74344. We are a church leading people into a real and life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ that is contagious. We look forward to seeing you next week.